Welcome to the Earning Freedom Program. Today we're continuing on with our Mastermind Straight A Guide course. I'm really excited to share this interview with my friend Seth Ferranti, who's just an awesome dude who not only went through a quarter century in prison, but came back really strong with his dignity intact, pursuing his dream and building his career. I think he's, you're going to find real interest in his story um, because we're going to hear about how he used his time in prison, always thinking about the career he wanted to build. Tell us a little bit about what brought you into the prison system, Seth. Um, basically, I, I got involved in, in drugs probably at a real young age, around 13, you know, just doing drugs. And that, that eventually led to me selling drugs by the time I was 16. And, um, you know, by the time I, I was 19, I was supplying 15 colleges in five states. And in 1991, I, uh, I got indicted federally for, on a CCE charge. CCE charge. And what were you facing on that charge? I was facing 20 to life. And you ended up getting what? After, did you go to trial or did you plead guilty? Actually, I, I pled guilty and then I took off and I was a fugitive for two years. And when I got caught, I got sentenced to 304 months. So how old were you when you got caught, when you actually got taken into custody? Uh, I was 22 years old. And because you had that record of escape or being a fugitive, they put you in a, in a uh, high security prison as a young man with about a quarter century to serve. Tell us a little bit about your mindset when you first went into the prison. I would say really when I first went into prison, I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I, I'd seen the movies, but it's not like anybody in my family or people I knew, you know, visited prison, you know, frequently. So it, it was really kind of the unknown for me. You know, I, I'll admit it at 22, you know, I was, I was a little scared cause I, you know, a little apprehensive. I, I didn't know what to expect. And uh, I mean, it was really like just being put in another world to me. I, I always refer in my writing, I refer to prison as like the nether world of corruption and violence, you know, cause it is. And, you know, when I got in there, I, I didn't really know what direction I, I did. I, it was the first time I was, you know, completely off drugs. And the first time I kind of had a clear head in, in probably about eight or nine years. And I had built up this image of myself that I, I was a drug dealer. I was an outlaw. And now I got 25 years for it at the age of 22. So I'm, I'm sitting in prison. And I really, you know, was like on a discovery to, to find myself and, and who I was. And what were you thinking about? How were you going to adjust? How did you expect to adjust through that 25 years when you first started? Oh, man. It, I mean, it, it was really crazy because... It was like every, everything that I, I built myself upon and, and, and who I wanted to be and, and how I identified it and saw myself. I mean, it was all kind of taken away from me in a moment. You know, when you get that sentence, you get that 25 years, it comes down. So then I'm in this, you know, I'm in, I'm in this scary environment with, with all these people, you know, that I, I'm not sure what they're about. I'm not sure, you know, what they're going to do. You, you hear all this stuff about prison. So, you know, I, I'd say the first couple of years, I, I kind of just stuck to myself because I was trying to figure out who I wanted to be in this prison world. I knew I had a lot, a lot of time to do. So, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't want to be considered, you know, like a, a punk or, or this or that or, or derogatory terms, you know, which people in prison come up with to label people. So I didn't want to be any of that. But, it, but at the same time, I, I, I was kind of, you know, walking a tightrope because, you know, I, I wanted to do things and I wanted to have a future, but at the same time, I wanted to be respected in the prison yard. So, you know, it was a very kind of trying time for me to kind of figure out who I was and, and what direction I was going to go with, with doing all this time and, and the confines where I was at. Did that conflict of wanting to prepare for a future and have a future while at the same time wanting to establish a prison reputation and walk that line of a quarter century, did that cause any type of problems for you in those beginning years? Oh, yeah. I mean, it always, I mean, just because prison, I mean, it's just, it's just like a real sick and twisted world and, and you know you might do things in prison that you wouldn't do on the street you know basically just to survive and so it, it was a conflict for me because you know you, you got all your peers everybody's there you're, you're in the block you know everybody's watching you to see how you're going to react you know but but at the same time i, I got these aspirations and, and dreams you know i want i want to get out and be successful i don't want to do more stuff to get in prison you know i don't want to you know violate or get more time or get myself in that situation but it was just a real, you know, delicate situation because you just have to be real careful. You know, I was myself, I was real careful who I was involved in, who I let in my circle, 
you know, and, and different stuff like that. So as you grew through the prison or started to mature, tell us a little bit about how your adjustment changed and what you started to do. Well, I think the first important step I did was uh, I enrolled in college classes. I took correspondence courses. I got my AA degree through Penn State. I got my BA degree through the University of Iowa. And I got my master's degree eventually through uh, California State University. And it, it's not like I did this stuff overnight. I mean, this is like a... I mean, I don't think I got my master's degree until almost 2010. So for me, this was like a 17-year journey in school. And I, I found when, when I really got involved in, in school stuff and, you know, what they call programming or whatever in prison, you know, it kind of took some of my time that I might have just been hanging out or in the TV room or, or hanging out with the guys and, and getting in trouble or doing stuff I wasn't supposed to because I had these deadlines. I had these papers I had to read, so I stayed a lot in the law library, typing up stuff and just, you know, in my room a lot, studying, you know, and, and, and reading the materials and, and gaining knowledge because, you know, they can take away years of your life while you're in prison and, and they can take away all the material things. But anything, any type of knowledge or wisdom you get or, or self-improvement, they can, no one can take that away. So you say that you got into these universities. A lot of guys in prison don't realize how to find a university. Tell us a little bit about the action steps you took to go from having this vision of wanting to prepare, your, this aspiration, if you said, uh, of coming back successfully. What type of action steps did you have to take in order to for, even find universities that would allow you to study? Well, I started, um, they, they actually got a couple guidebooks. I can't actually think of the name, but uh, this one prisoner from some state system, he, he wrote this really good college resource for prisoners and there's just all different types of programs a lot of li law libraries in prison now have them so all you got to do you know like I, I would go to the resource section in the library and i would start looking and i would start writing these places these different universities and i would find places that i could get degrees i would find places that were affordable you know that i could afford and i would find places that you could do the stuff correspondence and when you started getting those books in tell us a little bit about how you were able to tune out all of the different uh, competing uh, demands for your time so that you could focus on getting an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree. Because it's hard enough to get a university degree outside, but to get one in prison really takes discipline. Tell us your process for being able to stay focused on earning university degrees while you were inside. I would just say for me, I mean, first, you have to want it more than you don't want it. I really, I really wanted it. I wanted to improve myself. I wanted to do, you know, different things with my life. I, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, so I didn't want to fall into despair and all that. And then, I mean, plus, I mean, prison, you know, anybody who's been in prison, prison can be really boring, man. So, you know, it was really easy to kind of focus on something that was improving myself. Plus, you know, I'm, I'm interested in history. I'm interested in writing. I have a lot of interests in those areas, you know, literature and stuff like that. So, so reading the books and accomplishing something was really important to me. So I'm not saying it, it was easy because in, in prison, anybody that's been in prison, you know, it's like a constant din of noise and the block always types of stuff going on, people yelling and, and screaming. So, you know, a lot of times I, I would just put my headphones on, you know, if I, I had a good radio station or later when they had the MP3s, you know, I would listen to that and I would just kind of, you know, put the blinders on man, and, and focus on what was right for my future instead of what was going on in the penitentiary. And how did having those very clear, those very clear uh, paths to getting a university degree, how did that help you stay focused on that light that you described when you had multiple decades in prison to serve? I mean, I think really getting the college degrees, I mean, it, it, it gave me some, some positive self-worth. You know, I, I felt like I was, you know, contributing to society in my own way. I, I, I felt like I was doing something to improve myself because, I mean, really, the, there's not a lot of programs available in prison. So, I mean, whatever you can take, you know, I, I had the option of college degrees, like through my parents who pay for it. But, you know, even if I didn't have that option, there, there's different little college programs that I could have took. Maybe I couldn't have got a master's degree, but there's different stuff I could take. And um, it just helped me stay focused, man, because, when you're in there, there's just so much temptation to do wrong. And when you don't have anything positive, you know, then, then you might just focus on wrongdoing. But I found myself having the, the college courses and, the, and the, the positive stuff, it really 
almost anchored me, you know, to real life instead of to prison life. You know, because I, I was I was corresponding with real college professors in the world. You know, sometimes other students, and it just it just made me feel. Uh, I mean, it just gave me a tremendous amount of self worth. It made me feel valuable. It made made me feel like I was a person. Whereas you know, in, in prison, you just you know, you, you get into things and, you know, it's so dehumanizing the way you, they treat you, the way the other prisoners treat you. And if you get caught up in that, you can turn into an animal. So I think doing the college courses, it, it really kind of anchored me and, and made me feel like a human being and that I had a future. So you were in prisons with thousands of people, all secure prisons. You never got to minimum security. While you were inside those prisons, how many other people did you find in a typical institution, or if you want to take your whole journey through prison, how many other people pursued that same type of path as you? I mean, I would see some people that, you know, were taking college courses that they offered and, and some people getting certificates or, you know, little year degrees or even AAs. But I mean, it wasn't a lot of people. Even uh, I took the college classes when I first got to SCI Manchester in, in 93 and a lot of times, this was when they still had the Pell Grants way back when, and a lot of times it would start out, there would be like 20 or 25 guys in the class, but by the end of the semester, there might only be, you know, five, six, seven, eight, you know, because of different reasons, you know, guys lose interest, they go to the hole, you know, they're homeboys, you know, that want to draw them into prison stuff, or like, why are you messing with that? Why are you doing that? It's not going to do you any good. You know, it's a, it's a lot of negativity that you have to overcome from, from your peers, administration, and everybody you know, to focus on this. So, I mean, really people, they got master's degrees. I mean, it's probably less than 1%. Well, the reason that I ask you that is because I know how hard it is and I know how difficult it is to stay focused on that. But what I, I ask you that question just to point out, hey, it's very few people who pursue this path, but the people who do pursue this path, they end up having a really extraordinarily successful journey through prison and then their return to society is far more successful and there's nobody that can articulate that better than you because of your success. So tell us a little bit about how pursuing an education influenced your life in prison and what your thoughts were for how this uh, educational programming was going to influence your life when you came out of prison. Well, kind of, I kind of went with the premise that the, the, the directions that I was, or the decisions that I was making every day in prison, you know, would would profoundly impact, you know, when I got out. I, I knew everything I was doing. I used to ask myself, like, what am I doing today that's going to affect my future? You know, because all of us were kind of like, you know, creatures of convenience. You know, we want to be comfortable. We want to have the status. You know, we want to be have the reputation or be well-known or anything. So, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. It probably, my first, it took me eight, nine, ten years to kind of lose you know, that thing where, where I wanted to be important on the prison compound that I was at. I wanted to be known, you know, for whatever, you know, a, a go hard white boy or, or a solid convict or whatever. So it took me a good nine, 10 years before I kind of matured. You know, I was doing college classes the whole time, but, you know, finally I matured and, and I was like, you know what, what is important? It's not important what people think of me in here. It's not important what you know, these relationships I have, even though, you know, some might be good relationships, but the ones, the good people that you meet, you know, they're going to accept you for who you are. You know, they're not going to care about, you know, if you're this tough guy or if you're this or that, like a lot of the stuff that's important in prison. You know, they're, 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 they're going to care about, you know, what are you going to do for your future, especially if you're getting out? I mean, you got so many do, guys doing life. I mean, they're fighting their case to get out. But when, when you do have a date, man, I just think it's, it's tremendously important to, to prepare you for your future and do something every day you know, that's going to count for the future. Because if you don't, if you don't give yourself the tools, you know, and the different assets or, or whatever you need, when you get out, you're going to go right back to the same thing and you're going to end right back in prison. And how did your adjustment, when you really started to get serious about your education and the, the goals that you were achieving in prison and taking really solid action steps that would lead you to success, tell us how your that influenced your relationship with people outside, your family and the people in your support group. Tell us about that. I think once, you know, once they saw that I was making positive steps, you know, it, it was a process too because I came into prison and, you know, everybody thought I was a drug dealer. I, I was a drug addict. You know, I kind of like, you know, disgraced my family and friends and even my community, you know. So I, I, I had to earn the, the trust back, man. I, I had to earn those relationships back. So, 
you know, as, as I was going, like, the first, you know, five to ten years as I was doing this stuff, I'm sure, like, my parents and, and my family and friends, they were like, okay, you know, maybe he's doing the right thing. But at the same time, they had in the back of his mind, well, you know, he's a drug addict or he's a drug dealer. So it was really hard to fight and overcome that. You know, and I, I still get some of that even after doing 21 years and now being out for three years. I can still get some of that sometimes, you know, because people go with the, you know, the adage that, you know, tigers don't change your stripes and stuff like that. And it's true in a lot of cases, but that's something I, I had to fight. You know, I had to fight that stigmatism, you know, just from, from my own family and friends. I mean, they were proud of what I was doing, but it was still, I, I was fighting that stigma and trying to overcome it. And I think now, you know, now I, I, I got it where, you know, people are going to give me the benefit of the doubt. But, I mean, that's something that was a long time coming, and, and that's something that was very hard earned. And, and anybody that's been in that situation, you know, they got to fight in the same battle and, and go through the same thing to, to earn that trust, not only of your friends and, and family and relatives, but, you know, society as a whole. You have to earn that trust back that you deserve to be a citizen, you know, and, and live in this world that, you know, we have, which is, you know, anybody who's been out, of, you know, it's way better in prison. I mean, prison sucks. Anybody that knows her knows that. But you didn't only just do time in prison and you didn't only go through school in prison. You had a far more successful journey than, than, than simply getting certificates or degrees. Tell us a little bit more about what you were able to accomplish during the 21 years that you served. Well, um, I, I started writing books. This is actually, I wrote this, Prison Stories. This is like the first book I wrote. I published this in uh, 2005, you know, and um, just through taking the college classes and, and creative writing and a lot of nonfiction, I found that, you know, and I had a lot of time, so I, I really kind of honed my craft as a writer, and I went on, you know, I got, I got like 22 books out now, but these are some, this is the second one I wrote, Street Legends Volume 1, you know, and then I did this one, Street Legends Volume 2. And this is probably one of my most popular books, uh, The Supreme Team. So, I, you know, the first prison stories was kind of like my prison journey, like my first two years, what I was going through and what I was experiencing. You know, and then, then I started writing uh, more about other people. You know, I was, I was locked up, you know, with a, a lot of different criminals and, and gangsters, and I, I started writing their stories. And what I was doing when I was writing their stories because the mainstream media – you know, in the news, they, they always paint these pictures of these criminals or these gangsters. And, you know, some are, you know, deserved, you know, because some of these guys, I mean, I've been in there. Some of these guys are psychopath, vicious guys. They deserve to be in prison. But there's a lot of guys that were just making money. So when I started writing these books, I would take the legend, you know, and the, and the, the news reports and all the, you know, all the indictment stuff. But I, I would try to paint a picture of the person as, as a human because our, our criminal justice system you know, that's what they do. They, they do dehumanize people so they can give them 20 or 30 years or life sentence. And, you know, I believe some people that do certain things should deserve a life in prison. But for selling drugs, I don't believe that you should get life in prison. So I try, I try to humanize a lot of these people and show, you know, whatever, that's the world they were in. You know, they did some things that they had to do, you know, but really they're not bad people. It's just a lot of areas of gray instead of just being black and white. So there's a lot of action steps I'm hearing you took. You went into prison, had a mindset that I'm going to try and figure it out while I'm in here. After a couple of years, you decide to start going to school, preparing for an aspiration of what you wanted to do, go through education, but then you started writing first about your own life. Then you start interviewing other people around you, telling their stories. Tell us about the action steps you had to take to turn all of that work from taking a pen, writing on a piece of paper, turning that piece of paper into a, uh, a sentence, that, those words into sentences, those sentences into paragraphs, those paragraphs into, into manuscripts. How do, you, how do you go while you're in prison to turning those manuscripts into the types of books that you just held up for us? Well, the first thing I did was, you know, I always tell people this all the time. The first thing you need to do, you just need to write. I mean, if you want to write a book, you got to come up with a plan and you just have to write it. I mean, the first draft you write might not be any good, but at least you got something, you got something down. And then, you know, once I started, you know, crafting my manuscript, like, like even it, it's like anything. I mean, I was lucky in the regard that I was taking the college classes and they were kind of, you know, teaching me how to write and edit my own stuff. So I kind of took what I learned there. And I applied it to my first book, Prison Stories. And um, I just edited and edited. And then, 
you know, my, I had my wife, you know, I would send stuff, I would type stuff, send it out to my wife. She would scan it on the computer. She would send it back and we would continue editing back and forth. And I mean, this, this could be like a, you know, a year, year and a half process for a book that we might go back and forth like 10 or 15 times before it's even ready, you know, to show to anybody. And then what I did when I, when I got the idea, you know, in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands, I got the idea to open my publishing house and publish my books. I just basically, I read like about 30 books on self-publishing. You know, and I, I just made a plan. I, I'm the type of person, anytime I do anything, like if I want to learn about real estate, if I, if I want to learn about banking or, or credit cards, whatever I want to learn about, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to get as many books on the subject as I can, and I'm going to read them all. And then from reading all those books, I'm going to take, you know, I might take this part from this book, I might take this part, and I, I develop my own plan. You know, because mo most people, if you, if you give yourself a basis or a foundation of the knowledge of whatever, you know, trade or market you're trying to get into, you know, then, you know, you can start coming up with your own ideas and your own plan and, and mashing, you know, different parts of different people's ideas that you read in books together to formulate your own thing. And that's, that's, that's basically what I did. And I mean, I, I'm still publishing today. I, I'm still learning. It's not something, you know, that I got perfect the first time. You know, we made a lot of mistakes. You know, we, we had a lot of help with other people that helped us. So, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a process, man. But it was a process that I stuck to because what getting the college degrees taught me is uh, it's, it's almost like you set a goal, you set accomplishment, and you say, I want to get this AA degree. And then you have to get those 60 credits over how many years it takes, you know, to get it. So that's what I learned. It's, it's, it's about setting the goal, but then it's about following through and accomplishing the goal you know, through the, whatever journey it takes you to get there. If it takes a couple years, you know, six months, three months, if it takes 10 years, if it takes 20 years, it's about the follow through. So I felt like, uh, you know, that was really one of my biggest attributes was just being able to follow through and accomplish the goals that I set for myself. And it was the little goals that you, that you, that you pursued in the very beginning, such as going to school that taught you how to write. Then by learning how to write, you were able to start actually writing for publication and then you were able to start mastering the craft of learning how to open opening a publishing company and publishing yourself from prison that said during your during your uh, what you were just telling us you said that you your wife helped you you said you went into prison when you were 22 years old you had a quarter century to serve tell us how does a guy hold on to a wife through that type of struggle well me and my wife uh, we weren't married when I went to prison, she, she was one of my girlfriends. You know, I, I, I had a couple of different girlfriends, like a lot of dudes in prison, you know, they, they kind of, you know, have, have different girls or whatever. I mean, that's just what, uh, you know, people in the criminal lifestyle do. Well, not all, but that's what I did. So um, actually, you know, we got married, uh, probably, we got married like 2005 while I was in, when I was in FCI, Gilmer, and it was just like a relationship, you know, she was my girl and she, and she kind of stayed with me. And um, I think she really might have seen the potential and, and, you know, loved me more at first. But, you know, eventually, after all the years, I, I realized, you know, what a good girl I had. And um, that's what I was doing. I, I was trying to generate, you know, do different things to try to generate a future for me and her and for, for me publishing and, and, and writing articles. That was a way that I could do it. And that was also a way you know, for something that we could do in common, you know, and, and build, you know, for our future. So, I mean, but I, I know I, I was pretty lucky in, in regard to, to the woman, you know, that I got, who was my girlfriend, who I eventually married. I mean, it doesn't happen for everybody, but, uh, you know, luckily it happened for me. It sure was lucky that it happened for you and that when you had that relationship, you were able to really operate as a team where you're both supporting each other and it kind of removes you from the prison and allows you to kind of live inside of the world through her. And you said that you were, she was assisting you along the way, being your advocate, helping you by writing. You'd write your manuscripts. You'd send them home to, to your wife. Your wife would send them back to you. You know, by working as a team, it's almost as if, yeah, you're locked up in prison, but you're really building this ladder. You're building this pathway out to successful life. And you've now been out, as you said, for three years. Tell us a little bit about how the decisions and the preparations you made while you were inside influenced your ability to come back to society successfully. Well, I think, I think probably around 
you know, around the late 90s, early 2000s is, is, is when I really decided, you know, after I'd been in for, you know, about six or seven years, almost, you know, eight, nine, ten years, I was like, you know, I, I, I got to start preparing for my future. So, I mean, every, every, every step was kind of like a little incremental step that I, that I had to take, but it all, it all built together. So, and even, even I tell people this all, all the year, like a lot of people tell me out here, they say, man, you do so much. How did you get out? How did you adjust after doing all that time? You know, because they say, you know, a lot of people, you know, get out, they're whacked out or this or that, or they go back to crime. And I, and I always tell them, I mean, really, it's, it's through reading. I mean, reading is what was really big for me, you know, to, to start my writing, reading all the history books. And but then I tell people, too, my, my last two years, all I did was I probably read like every uh, idiot's guide or, or dummy's guide you know, to like the internet, to, to iPhones, to MacBooks. That's all I did in my last two years, you know, besides writing and stuff like that and, and bringing my other plans that I had for when, when I got out. Because I, I had a big uh, challenge. You know, I, I didn't know anything about the internet. They didn't have the internet when I went in 93. You know, they didn't have smartphones. You know, when I was out there, they had the big phones that are like bricks. That was like the cell phones. So just it was really crazy, and I, I kind of had to – you know, I, I had to get my head around all this stuff. So I, I spent two years, like, I, I think, like, the iPhone and the Internet and, and the MacBook books, I, I might have read those, like, three or four times. So, and I, I was asking all types of dudes that had only been in there a couple of years, you know, what's up with this? What's up with this? Because I, I just had a lot I had to get my head around. But, you know, through my preparation and through all that, I really felt like I, I hit the ground running. You know, I got out. I got two jobs. I was in the halfway house for three months. I got home confinement. You know, I went on probation after I was doing so good after a year, they, they cut me free from probation. So, you know, it's just, it's, it, but it's not, it's not only about preparation. It, you know, everybody knows what's right and wrong. Some guys try to say, Oh, I'm from here. I'm from here. This is what it's like. No, everybody knows what's right and wrong. So, you know, let, let, let's get through that. Like you don't know what's right and wrong, you know, what's right and wrong. So it's not only about preparation and, and getting yourself ready, you know, with wisdom and knowledge, through reading and learning stuff, but it's, 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 it's about making a decision. You got to make a decision. You say, okay, I'm, I'm going to walk on the you know, right side. I'm going to be a citizen. You know, sometimes in prison, citizen can be used as a dirty word. Like, oh, you're just a citizen. But, you know, I found now, and even when I was in there, I would rather be a citizen and, and be out here and enjoy, you know, the different things that you can do in this country and the freedoms you can have than, you know, be a criminal or be underground and, and end back up in prison. Because you keep doing criminal stuff, you know, you're going to end back up in there. So you got to realize that. That's what I had to realize. You know, it's not about the easy money. It's, it's about the hard work and, and making relationships and networking and getting a life together, you know, and, and, and being prepared and, and making the decision that says, you know what, I'm, I'm sick of this life. I'm sick of being a drug addict. I'm sick of being a criminal. I'm, I'm sick of dealing with all these, you know, cutthroat type of people. You know, I'm, I'm sick of being in prison. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this dehumanizing condition. You know, I want to go out in the world and, and enjoy what our world has to offer. So, you know, once I made that decision, and I, I probably made that decision with about, you know, 10, 12 years to go. So once I made that decision, I just, you know, I started preparing, doing whatever I could do every day, learning, looking at different things, you know, different business aspects. You know, I learned a lot about social media, just reading articles and stuff, you know, and, and books on it. You know, every, everything that I'm doing today, that the publishing you know, the social media stuff, the marketing, the network, all that. I learned all that in prison through reading books and, and articles about it. And that's what's allowed you to come back successfully, become a best-selling author. You're also a contributing writer to numerous online publications. And you got a new movie coming out, which is pretty exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about this movie that you're doing? Yeah, um, I've been for about two years since I've been out, I, I've been working on this movie. It, it's called White Boy. It's about Richard Worshey Jr. Who's, uh, he's in the Detroit system, or Michigan system. He's from Detroit. And he was a street legend from the mid 80s. But basically, he's been in prison 29 years now for eight kilos of cocaine. And, um, you know, I'm not going to say he kind of complicated matters because when he was in, uh, he cooperated with the FBI on a police corruption probe in Detroit and that's really why he's in because some of the people you know that he was he helped get convicted in that police corruption probe you know like their uh proteges or whatever are still in government in Detroit and Michigan and, and Wayne County and they've been trying to keep him in so this film we've been working on 
is, you know, the number one goal to get him out, but also to expose this, this justice because it's almost the, the, the drug war, man. There's so many dirty little secrets of the drug war. And now as time goes on, a lot of them are coming out, you know, because it, it, it's really inhumane. I mean, like I say, some people, I mean, if, if you murder people and chop people up and molest little kids and stuff like that, maybe you deserve to go to prison for life if that's what the laws call for. But right now, I mean, most of the prisons, over 50% of the prisons is, is nonviolent drug dealers, like this guy Richard Worshi, who we're trying to get out. And they just bury him in there, and it becomes more of an industry in, instead of justice. And so through this film and through his story, you know, we're, we're kind of showing all this just on – you know, just in, in Detroit, but the same thing that's happening in Detroit is, is happening all over. And this, this movie is actually is premiering at a film festival in Detroit uh, at the end of March. And then it'll um, be going on like a major mainstream streaming network, something like a Showtime, HBO, Netflix, you know, Amazon or Hulu. Well, I want, to, I, I want to thank you for spending the time with us today, Seth. I know that a lot of guys who are watching this inside of uh, segregated housing units or secure prisons or, or schools, they really need to get inspiring stories from people like you, people who have had an aspiration of uh, preparing themselves for success even while going through struggle, and then people who took the incremental action steps that allowed them to get from being a 22-year-old just starting in prison to becoming an accomplished, best-selling author, a movie producer, contributing member of society, husband, son. I mean, you're really the American success story. And I really want to thank, and you started inside of a federal prison with a quarter century to serve, but that never got you down. And that's why I wanted to share your story. Thanks so much for spending time with us. All right. Thank you. And uh, I mean, just for everybody who doesn't know, the man, Michael Santos, I was with him when we were doing time. And, and it was right around the uh, time when, I kind of made the jump. I was, I was kind of leaning in the right direction, but he kind of really, you know, showed me the way and helped me. So, uh, I mean, he, he can help anybody. You know, he helped me when I was in there. He can help anybody that's watching this. So, oh, Thanks so much, Seth. I'm so glad to consider you a friend and so proud to share your story with other people in prison. Together, we're going to help more guys come out successfully like you. Thanks so much. Thank you.